Well, welcome back to Medical Terminology 1, and uh, we're going to start today uh, talking about the musculoskeletal system and spend a little time talking on the skeletal system in particular. Uh, so um, without any further ado, you might as well go ahead and uh, fasten your seat belts because uh, this is going to be some ride. So here we go. Let's talk about that. First of all, you know, what does the musculoskeletal system, what's it really all about? First of all, we know we have bones, okay? And bones are basically the framework for body construction. I mean, we have a certain shape that we're in uh, based upon the fact that uh, uh, the bones give us some form and stuff like that. So um, the, the shape we are has a lot to do with that bone configuration. We also use um, bones for uh, protection, okay? Protection and support. Uh, think about the skull. Uh, if we didn't have a skull, what would happen to the brain? Because the brain sits inside the skull. What would happen to the brain? About the heart and the lungs inside the inside the chest cage. So it provides some protection and support. Uh, if I didn't have a back, backbone, if I was invertebrate, didn't have a backbone, basically we wouldn't be, be, be able to walk upright and stuff like that. So the, the skeletal system provides uh, protection support besides actually acting as a framework for body construction. Uh, allows for movement uh, by attachment of muscles. What happens is where two joints come together, that's called a joint. And that joint um, uh, is held together by what we'll, ligament and capsule. We'll talk about that a little bit later in another video coming up. What happens is muscle goes from one bone to the other. So when that muscle contracts and gets shorter, it actually moves one bone towards the other, and that's what produces movement. Bones are important in the, in the production of red blood cells, as well as white blood cells, as well as platelets. All the blood elements are, from, are made in the bone. Okay? And this is made actually in the area called the bone marrow. Um, the bone marrow has lots of cells, but only about 1 to 2 percent of these cells are what are called stem cells. And these stem cells depend upon what the stimulus is, because they become a red cell, could become a white cell, multiple different types of white cells, or a platelet, which is involved in clotting. And that occurs uh, in, um, in an infant. Almost all the bones, almost all the marrow areas or the bone marrow in most of the bones is able to produce uh, blood cells. However, as we get older, we start to lose parts of that. And it, as we get finally into our teens and our adults, what happens only the ends of some long bones are able to produce blood cells. But we still need the uh, bone marrow to be able to be a source or a site where bone where blood cells are produced. We also have the bone as a storage for minerals. I used to say, uh, what can you tell me about bone? And people say, it's hard. Well, why is it hard? Because I'll say because of calcium and stuff like that. Well, calcium is really important in the body, but it's more important for other things other than bone. It's stored in the bone that keeps the bone hard. That's true. But what happens is uh, the calcium is really more important for other things such as uh, uh, muscle contraction, uh, nerve conduction, a uh, heart muscle contraction, uh, clotting. So we need the calcium and other other places in the body uh, more vitally than actually in the bones. So therefore, if my uh, level of calcium in the blood goes down, what they do is the bone becomes a storage area. They take the calcium out of the bone. So basically, it's a storage area for calcium that could be used in other places of the body when it's needed. Yep, there's an advantage to it. If it's in the bone, it makes the bone harder, which is a good advantage. But on the other hand, if we need it somewhere else, it's going to take it out of the bone and put it somewhere else. That's why what happens later on in life, people get an osteoporosis, and then osteoporosis turns out where um, we don't have as much calcium that's deposited in the bone, and we're taking the calcium out of the bone to use it in other areas. Okay, so that's what bones are really involving in the body. Joints. Our joints are the places, like I mentioned before, where bones come together, where one bone meets another bone. That's a joint. And we have different types of joints, and we'll mention a few things about different types of joints down the road. But where we, where these bones come together, they're called joints. And the joints, uh, based upon what the shape of the joint is, what the joint's made of, allow motion. Okay. In some joints, there's a lot of motion. In others, there's very little. In some joints, there's actually no motion at all, such as those small little joints between the uh, 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 bones of the, of the cranium or the skull. And basically, there's no motion in those okay so that's what a joint is and then we also have the musculoskeletal system muscles and muscles attach uh, from bone to bone okay and what happens is when these muscles the thing about a muscle is able to contract it's able to shorten and when it shortens that produces movement okay so they have a contraction and relaxation type of a cycle contraction they get shorter and produce movement and relaxation is when the mo when the muscles on the opposite side of a limb or something like that will contract the muscles on the other side actually have to relax to get longer okay also, we other have other muscles which aren't really involved in the musculoskeletal system. They're, in, they're involved in movement of the viscera. Now, viscera, we talked about as a word, means organs, okay? Now, in the wall, these organs are what we call smooth muscle. However, I could actually extend this to further to skeletal muscle because sometimes skeletal muscle 
uh, is what is, is what's impor important in breathing. Okay, uh, the diaphragm is is a muscle. The there's muscles between the ribs, and it's really important in respiration. We'll talk about that later on when we get to the respiratory system down the road. And as well as sometimes the abdominal wall helps in moving things in this inside the abdominal cavity as well. So we do have skeletal muscle that might be a little bit involved, but most of the muscle that's involved in the viscera is called smooth muscle. Okay, which is a totally different type of muscle. It's still a muscle, but it's a different type of muscle. So that's what we see with that. That's muscle. Okay. Now a couple very simple words. Orthopedist. Okay. Ortho is a is a word root that actually means straight. Doesn't mean bone. A lot of people think ortho means bone, but doesn't. Ortho is a word root that actually means straight. And pedo means child, like pediatrics. Okay. Um, so orthopedo or orthopedist is actually uh, says straight child, but we really refer to it as people who who deal with uh, musculoskeletal type injuries. Rheumatologist. One word root that they have is rheumato. Rheumato. And rheumato means watery flow. A lot of things in rheumatology, rheumatological type of things, I have a lot of uh, 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 edema, which is a lot of fluid that collects in the tissues. And maybe that's where that came from. I really don't know for sure, but that's where that might come from. Okay. Well, let's talk about some terms here. Because these terms are going to be really, really important. Okay. And these are, there's a number here and sort of bear with me and I'll try to get you filled in as, as many of these terms as, as we can. The first is acetabulum. And the acetabulum is basically the hip socket. That area right there, that area right there, that area right there. That area. It's, a, it's a socket, and then the, the, the head of the, of the thigh bone, which is called the femur, has a ball which fits inside that. So that socket for the hip is called the acetabulum. acetabulum. The calcaneus, I should get me out of the way here. Let me move, see if I, can, I can't move myself. Okay. Anyway, the calcaneus is the heel bone. If we look down here, here's a foot down here. This is the heel bone that's down here. That's the bottom. When you feel that lump on the back of your foot, that's the calcaneus. That's the calcaneus. Carpals. Carpals are the wrist bones. And you can't really see them right here very much, but they sit right about there. And those are the carpals. Uh, we have um, eight carpals in our wrists, and that allows a little bit of movement this way and side to side a little bit. But those are called the carpals. So these are the wrist bones. And there are eight of those. Okay. Clavicle. Clavicle is a collarbone. Okay, you get hard to see in the small uh, image right here, but there's a clavicle right here. You know where the collarbone is. You can go ahead and feel it. So clavicle means collarbone. Coccyx. Here's the coccyx, a little tiny thing right down there. And the coccyx is the tailbone. You ever fall, fell on ice or sledding and you hit a hill and you come down off the hill and ooh, it starts to hurt deep in the buttock region. Maybe you actually fracture off the coccyx. Okay, so the coccyx is the tailbone. The cranium, the cranium is the part of the skull here that encloses the brain. Okay, so it's the top part. You actually see part of it here. That's the area that encloses the brain. So that's called the cranium. Okay, so the cranium would be this area up in here. The femur, we've already talked about the femur and this is the femur right here. That's the long thigh bone. So. The femur is this long thigh bone, uh, probably the longest uh, and probably the heaviest bone, individual bone in the body. Very strong. It's a little bit bent. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but that's that's the femur, the fibula. All right, I get down to the lower leg. Okay, let me get rid of something here. Let me get rid of my calcaneus right here. If we look down the lower leg, it's really hard to see here. Okay, but what happens is that fibula. Okay, if we if we if we look at the lower leg down in here, there's two bones on each side. There's a there's a small bone on the outside. Is a larger bone on the inside, which that large lateral side would be lateral, or the smaller bone would be lateral, and then the big one would be medial. Okay, the l smaller lateral bone that we get there, the smaller lateral bone is called the fibula. So it's a, it's the it's the uh, lateral most leg shin bone. If you feel around the ankle, you'll feel a bump on the on the lateral side of the ankle, and that's the very end of the fibula down in this down in the area down here, which is called the the fibular malleolus right about here, the humerus humerus is the upper arm bone. It's that one right there. So that's the upper arm bone. Uh, interesting bone, we'll talk a little bit about, more about it later on. The ilium. The ilium is the part of the pelvis right here. It's that big, big winged area. Here's the ilium right here, here's the ilium. If you feel the size of the hip, you'll feel this big crest, this big ridge of bone uh, on top of the hip, and that's called the ilium. It's a very large bone. And then below that, it's called the ischium. You can see it a little bit right here. There, see that little U-shaped thing right there? That's the ischium that sort of sits right there. Uh, the hamstrings, or the muscles that, that go on the back of the thigh, actually attach right to the bottom 
of the ischium down in there. Okay, and it's called the ischium. Uh, if you have noticed when you're sitting on a on a hard bench for a while and you have to keep on switching your butt around a little bit because it gets a little bit um, uh, uh, sore down there. What happens is the, the 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 muscles and stuff like that are right below. Uh, you know, the 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 ischium is right below that. So basically, that's what you're sitting on. And that's what causes that irritation. You have to move it around. You actually feel a very hard thing deep in the buttock region. That would go up from the bottom, and basically that's called the ischium. Okay. So those are some terms. Okay. So the hip socket again, uh, heel bone, uh, uh, wrist bones, uh, the collarbone we talked about. Uh, tailbone. I've been writing them in. They should have been. The, the, the cranium again is the top of the skull where the where the brain is. The femur is the thigh bone. The fibula is the smaller leg a leg bone on the lateral side. The humerus is the upper arm bone. The ilium is part of the pelvis. It's the upper larger portion of the pelvis. And the ischium is the lowest portion and and posterior in the back portion of the pelvis. Okay. So those are some of those terms. We got some more terms here coming up. Uh, the malleolus. Okay. If I feel the malleolus. On both the inside and the outside of the ankle, there's a bump. There'll be a bump right, a bump right here, and a bump right here. So on both sides, and those are called the malleoli. Okay, the medial malleolus is from the larger of the two shin bones, which is called the tibia, and the lateral malleolus is the is the very uh, distal end of the fibula. Okay, so the tibia is the medial. Lateral is the fibula, okay? So basically, that, that's called the malleol. So the little lumps on the bone. Just as a, a little example, if you take your foot and you feel them, okay, put your foot straight forward, which is the way it's going to be anyway, and you feel the medial malleolus, put your fingertip on the tip of the medial malleolus and the tip of the lateral malleolus. You see, in most cases, the lateral malleolus is a little bit more posterior than the medial malleolus, as well as the lateral malleolus goes actually further down, further distal than the medial malleolus. That's what provides a little bit of the stability to that ankle joint. Okay, next word here we have is called the mandible. The mandible is the lower jawbone. This area here is called the mandible. Hard to see right there, there's the mandible right there. The lower jawbone will be called the mandible. The upper jawbone is called the maxilla. So that's the area just where the upper teeth would attach. So that would be called the maxilla. The upper upper jawbone would be the, would be the maxilla. Metacarpals. Metacarpals are the hand bones. Now if I take my hand right here and you look in the image, these bones right here across the hand here are the metacarpals. That would be the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth metacarpals. So they come across my hand at that way, and those are called the metacarpals. Okay, they're the hand bones uh, that provide the meaty portion of the hand. Similarly, in the foot, I have what are called the metacarpal metatarsals. These bones right here are the metatarsals. That's the same similar area in the foot, the long area of the foot, just before the toes start. Those are called the metatarsals. So that's the metatarsals. The olecranon. On the back of the elbow, right in here and right in here, there's a little knob. Now, if you take your elbow and you feel right here, you bend your elbow, you feel a little bump right there. That little bump right there is called the olecranon or called the olecranon process, okay? You see how I hit my funny bone? Well, you're, you hit that area around the olecranon, okay? But the, what you actually hit is right to the one side of it, to the medial side of it, there's a little groove. So if you feel that little bump, the olecranon right there, and go a little bit to the medial side, you'll feel a little groove. And that little groove right there, there's a nerve that runs in there called the ulnar nerve. So when you bang your elbow, your fingers start to tingle and stuff like that. And you get that pain that shoots down your arm. You're actually not hitting, quote, the funny bone, which would be, quote, the olecranon. But you're actually hitting the area and, 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 and making and bumping the area of that ulnar nerve, which causes that shooting pain. And if you notice, next time it happens, just for the curiosity, feel your little finger and this part of the ring finger, only this part of the ring, not this part, but this part and the little finger. That's where you'll feel some tingling. You'll feel some numbness and tingling down that the little finger, this part of the ring finger, and down the lateral side or the medial side of your of your palm, down in this area and the back of the hand right there. And that's where you'll get that numbness because that's where the ulnar nerve goes. Okay, so that's that. The next word we have in our list here is the patella. The patella is the kneecap. You know, we see a kneecap right there. We see a kneecap right there. So the patella is the kneecap. Okay, kneecap's an interesting uh, bone because it sits in a groove. The front of the femur has a little groove like that, and the patella sits in it like this. Okay, and sometimes that patella goes out of spot. Okay, I know that my uh, my younger son uh, who played uh, uh, soccer, lacrosse, and hockey had multiple, multiple, multiple patellar dislocations. They usually go to the lateral side. I remember the first time it happened, um, he was playing soccer when he was much younger. Okay, he was playing at a, a travel soccer team. 
And uh, I was working in the clinic that morning, and uh, um, so he was starting to play. I went, got to the field, and I'm walking towards the, the field to watch the game. I'm behind the net, walking towards where the, the sidelines would be, and a uh, simple ball comes down. He was in goal that day. Went down to sort of get the ball, perfect form, nothing like that. All of a sudden, he just falls like he was shot with a with a with a, uh, a bullet. Just fell, and and the other and the guy, the other team's uh, forward, came and kicked the ball in the net. Well, my son's, uh, the fullback on my son's team comes up and starts yelling at him, Jared, what's wrong with you? You, Even, you know, and even me, the old guy walking from behind says, you know, is yelling, Jared, even your grandmother could have stopped that one. Until I went out and saw, and the fullback, his teammate that was standing next to him, all of a sudden starts retching. I wonder what's going on. I go out, and sure enough, there's his patella. His patella sitting on the side of the knee. So he says, "Uh, Dad, can you pop it in? I asked him if I could go home and get my camera, and he wasn't too happy about that, but I popped it in. But anyway, he had both, he had surgery for both of those. And that what, the, what the kneecap really does, okay, uh, is that it actually improves the strength of the, of the quadriceps muscles, which are the muscles in the front of the thigh. So it improves them by the way that kneecap sits, okay? Phalanges. Phalanges are the finger and toe bones, okay? If you look at the fingers, okay, I have, I have three right here, three right here, three right here, three right here, and two in the thumb on each side. And all those individual bones are called phalanges, okay? Uh, the singular would be phalanx, phalanges would be multiple. And these are the small finger and toe bones, okay? Uh, because I have uh, three in the in the index, middle, ring, and little finger, and two in the thumb. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. So basically there's fourteen on each hand and fourteen on each foot. Okay, so that's called the, those are called the phalanges. You can see here's the phalanges that would be in the foot out here, and I'm sitting in the way of the phalanges on the hand, which are back in underneath here. Sorry about that. Okay, you can see that on the PowerPoint if you look at it. Uh, pubis, right here is where the pelvis comes together in the front. The area where the pelvis comes to the, together in the front is called the pubis. Okay, right where it comes together in the front, that's called the pubis. So the pubis is actually the anterior portion of the pelvic bone. The pelvis, this large thing right here, is actually three bones in one. Three bones in one, okay? Because I have the ilium, which is the big one up in here, the ischium, which is that hoop that's on the posterior inferior side, and the pubis where it comes together. Uh, in, a, in a newborn and in a child, actually, you'll actually see on an x-ray, they'll actually look like three different bones. And right where that acetabulum is, because we all know the acetabulum is that socket for the hip, all these three bones come together in like a Y-shaped inside inside the acetabulum, inside the hip socket. Eventually, at a certain age, they all fuse together and become solid. But the pubis is the one in the front. If you actually feel, you know, down in your lower abdomen, just 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 appear to the general region, you'll feel the harder area of the pelvis. That's called the pubis. Okay. The radius. If I look at the forearm, there are two bones in the forearm. There are two bones in the lower leg. There are two bones in the forearm. Now, we talked about anatomical position. In anatomical position, that palms are facing forward at the side of the body. So what happens is the radius is the lateral most of the forearm bones, okay? So if we look at the, at the body in anatomical position, the radius is lateral most. In other words, if you look, the palms are facing forward, so the thumb's facing, facing laterally in both situations. And what will happen is the bone that articulates that's uh, the, in, in, the, in the forearm that's just proximal to the thumb and the, and, the, and the lateral side of the hand would be called the radius. The reason why I call the radius is if I look at the arm, what happens is this motion right here is not produced much at the radius. That's a produce of what's called the ulna and the humerus. But what happens is rotation motion. If I take my arm and rotate it around, it radiates around. And as a result, that's why they call it the radius. So this is the lower arm bone on the lateral side. So it's on the lateral side, okay? The scapula. Scapula is just another word for the shoulder blade. So if we look right here, here's a scapula right there. There's a scapula right there. Okay. So that's the shoulder blade. They're on both sides. Okay. And that's and there's a socket up there where the humerus will attach to. Okay. That's right in, in that area. So that's called the scapula. So the scapula is basically the shoulder. Okay. A couple more uh, terms. The sternum. The sternum is the breastbone. Okay. Now the breastbone is actually another three in one, okay? So it's the breastbone, it's another three in one bone, where we have a top part, which is called the manubrium, the larger part below, part below that, which is called the body, and there's a little thing at the bottom, a little V-shaped area at the very bottom, right down here, which is called the xiphoid. If you take your finger and you feel at the base of your neck, you actually feel like a little upside down, or a little bit of a U-shaped area, a little depression, looks like that. That's the top of the manubrium. The manubrium comes like that, comes down this way, down like this, so like that, that way, that way, and then right here, is the area where where the where the sternum 
uh, the, the manubrium means what's called the body, which comes down here. The, and what'll happen is the first rib will attach here, the second rib attaches right here, right where the manubrium meets the body, right at that area. Now, if you take and you feel that little notch right here, this is called the jugular notch. So the notch right here is called the jugular notch. Okay, now if you take your fingers and just go down from that, go inferior to that, just maybe about, oh, maybe about about that that far, if you can see, okay, you're going to feel a, a ridge goes from side to side, goes across this way, and that's this area right here where the manubrium meets the body, and that area is called the sternal angle. And the reason why that's important clinically is that's the area where the second rib attaches. So you always know where that second rib is because it attaches right at that sternal angle. And the rest of the ribs will attach down here. At the bottom of the body of the sternum, there'll be a little area that sits down here. Sometimes there's a little hole in it. And that area down here would be called the xiphoid. And there's sometimes people will sit there and they can actually put their fingers on it and click it around a little bit. I don't know. I don't think that's wise, but some people will do that. So let me get the sternum out of the way. So the sternum we know is that breastbone. Okay, next next uh, vocabulary word are the tarsals. So this is the hind foot bones. So if I look back, if I look back in this area right here, okay, here's my metatarsals like we talked about before, and then back in here, uh, in the hand, I said I had eight carpal bones. Down here in the tarsals, I have seven tarsal bones. Seven tarsal bones. I wish I had calcaneus. We talked about before was one. So these are what we call the hind foot bones. They're in the back of the foot. Okay before they get to the metatarsals, which would be out here, and then the phalanges would be out at this area. The tibia. The tibia we talked about before, and that's the larger of the two shin bones, okay? And it's on the medial side, the medial side, okay? And that's where that medial malleolus is, that lump on the inside portion of the ankle right there, and that's the end of the tibia on the medial side. That's the end of the tibia, okay? One more vocabulary word is the ulna. Now we talked about the radius down here, which would be lateral. The ulna is on the medial side as well. It's on the medial side of the forearm. And again, the ulna actually has, the, the humerus comes down, has a little knob at the end of it like this, and the ulna comes around it like this. And here would be the olecranon, so this is posterior here. Here's the olecranon right here. This is this right here is called the coronoid process. You don't have to remember that. And the ulna comes down this way, okay? This whole area is the ulna. And this actually acts like a hinge, and that provides this type of a motion of, of the elbow. And again, if I'm looking at the arm, the arm comes down here, the humerus comes down here, the ulna is on the medial side, and the radius is on the lateral side, okay? Vertebrae, okay, shouldn't have to tell about vertebrae, and those are the backbones. We actually have, we'll talk a little bit more about the backbones in a little bit, how they're seg, seg, uh, separated out. The ones in the neck are called cervical vertebrae, the ones in the chest are called thoracic, the ones in the lower back are called lumbar, then we have the sacral vertebrae right there, and the coccyx, which is below that. So they're one on top of each other, and they provide uh, motion, a little bit of rotation around, but they do hold the body in an upright position. Okay, they're all seated well and articulated very well with the pelvis. And you can see right here, here'd be the lumbar vertebrae, here's the thoracic vertebrae, here's the cervical vertebrae, sacrum is down here, and the coccyx would be a little thing sitting down in there. Okay. A couple more vocabulary terms that I think we should talk about. One would be a chromion. Okay, now this is a picture of the scapula. Okay. And this up here at the top is the, is called the acromion. And what happens is right here, you see a little depression right here? And that's where the, the humerus is going to sit. There's a little ball area of the humerus that sits right in this depression right there, which is called the glenoid. Now, if you take your hand and you feel the top of your shoulder, feel right at the top of your shoulder, feel, feel how hard it feels. What you're actually feeling is the top of the acromion right there. Okay, so the top of the acromion would be right there, and that's what you feel. This area right here actually has a joint that connects to the clavicle. So if you take it, you feel that little hard part, and you come forward and more anteriorly, okay, and more towards medial, you actually feel the clavicle that starts where that acromion is, and then works all the way, and it attaches right to the sternum, like I mentioned before, okay? So the top of the sternum right here is called the acromion. Articular cartilage, okay, let me get rid of that so you can see what the articular cartilage is. Articular cartilage is, a, is this area at the end of the joint, okay? Now, if I look right here, down in this particular view right here, this would be the femur right here, this would be the tibia, and here's the patella or the kneecap, which we all know. And what happens is, is the surface of those, of those bones are, are covered with this cartilage, which is called articular cartilage, because articular means joint. So all this blue area would be cartilage, covered with cartilage. Now what the cartilage does, it provides a smooth surface so that we have smooth movement of the joint, 
Okay, if you look at a chicken bone at the end of like a, if you get a chicken wing or something like that, if you look at the end of the bone, it's sort of like glistening and shining, and that's the cartilage that's still left at the end of the bone. Okay, when people get things like osteoarthritis, this cartilage gets worn away, <clears throat> it gets rubbed down because of movement, it gets rubbed down, rubbed down more, rubbed down more, rubbed down more. Eventually, what happens is you could actually wear all the way through that entire cartilage and wear it all the way down to bone, and that's what causes a lot of problems, a lot of pain, is when the cartilage gets worn away. <clears throat> there are other things. That will actually um, wear away the cartilage, but that would be the biggest one. It's called osteoarthritis. So the articular cartilage is cartilage that's at the end of bones to allow smooth movement. It's just a smooth surface. And what happens is the joint actually has what's called a capsule, and the capsule makes fluid that actually lubricates and makes these joint surfaces nice and slippery so they could slide even better. Okay, so that's the articular cartilage, which is basically at the end, end of the bones, called articular cartilage. Okay, and that's important to know. Cartilaginous tissue is basically uh, anything that's cartilage. Okay, cartilaginous cartilage. Okay, that's that. Condyles. <clears throat> if I look at a bone, and this bone probably shows it a little bit, what happens at the end of the bone, at the end of a bone, there's a rounded area. This is rounded area right there. Those rounded areas are called condyles. I'll show you some pictures of condyles in another video circuit video that's coming up. So those are the condyles, these are little rounded. If I was to say, draw a picture of a bone, I bet you most of you people do like this. You know, and these areas, these rounded areas at the end of the bone would be called condyles. Bone. Do I have to tell you what a bone is? You know, bone is what provides structure, uh, allows uh, blood cells to be produced there, so air storage area for calcium and other minerals and things like that. And calcium, we know, is that mineral that basically provides bone strength. However, that calcium is more importantly needed for muscle contraction, uh, nerve conduction, uh, clotting, uh, heart muscle contraction, and, and stuff like that. Okay, So that's probably more what that calcium is. And again, if I need it in other areas, the, the body actually behind the thyroid gland, the thyroid gland's in the neck, <clears throat> sort of like a the thyroid gland, sort of like a little H-shaped gland that sits in the neck. It looks like that. Okay. On the back side of the thyroid are small little lumps of tissue, and they're called the parathyroid glands. There's anywhere between four to eight of these little lumps. They're called the parathyroids. These make a hormone that will actually go and take the calcium out of the bone to stick it in the blood to be taken and used where it, where it needs to be used in other places. So basically, that's what calcium is. Uh, when people have osteoporosis, usually their serum calcium goes very low. So they take the more and more calcium out of the bone to use in other places where it needs to be. As a result, what happens, what gives the bone its strength is the crystalline nature. And the crystals that are formed on the bone are basically, basically formed from calcium. Okay. We have a couple different types of bone here in my next words. One's called cancellous and one's called compact. Okay. Now let's say this is, a, this is what we call a long bone. <clears throat> and a long bone <clears throat> has a shell on the outside. And that bone is really dense, very dense, very hard. And that's what we see what's called compact bone. Compact bone is also called a cortical bone. Sometimes you'll see it cortical, cortical, a compact, dense bone. Now, if you were to look at a soup bone, you'd see the bone right there. And on the outside, it would be very hard. And the inside looks softer and mushier. And that inside would be called the cancellous bone. So if you look inside the cancellous bone inside here, let me do it in a different color so you'll be able to see a little bit different. This whole area in here would be all cancellous bone that fills the inside. It's, it's also called spongy bone, cancellous bone called spongy bone. Sometimes it's called uh, trabecular bone because there's little spikes in there which are called trabeculi, okay, called trabecular bone. Uh, I hate the word soft bone, but I've actually some people use soft bone and some people use hard bone for compact bone. <clears throat> I, I hate those. I, I, I would probably not encourage that. Uh, it's also sometimes called medullary bone because there's a canal down the middle, which is called the medullary canal. And that, com and that co cancellous bone fills that medullary canal that goes down the, down the center. But the, the co compact bone is that dense bone that's around the outside. Um, this area of the bone, the middle of it, which is called the shaft of the diaphysis, has looks very much like that soup bone. It has a very dense piece of bone on the outside and that soft, spongier area with a lot of marrow on the inside, which we will see as spongy bone or cancellous bone. Okay, Collagen. Collagen is important. Collagen is a connective tissue. There are certain uh, cells in the body, and they're called fibroblasts. And what these fibroblasts do is they spit collagen. And bone, even though we think of bone as being hard, bone will bend a slight amount, okay? It has to, because if the bone is too hard, it becomes too brittle, 
okay, and the bone will crack. They actually have a, a condition that's called osteopetrosis. P-E-T-R means rock, okay? Uh, Peter, rock, okay? Uh, so uh, uh, th there's a portion of the skull which is called the petrous portion, which is a very rock-hard portion of the skull. Uh, if the bone was too hard, such as an osteopetrosis or other things like that, or when people used to l use a lot of fluoride, when they used to overdose with fluoride, you know, give or put too much fluoride in their water or their meals or, or something like that, and they get what's called a hyperfluorosis, the bone becomes too dense and it doesn't bend. So as a result, any kind of stress to it will cause the bone to crack. Something that's more dense and harder will actually shatter much more easily than something that has a little bit of a give to it. So what happens is this collagen does give the bone a little bit of a bend. Also, to be able to lay down the, 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 the uh, uh, calcium, okay, which is called hydroxyapatite, there's calcium and a bunch of other things that are together in this, this, these crystals, to be able to lay they have to have something to lay it down on. So what happens is the bone actually has a matrix or has like a web work of collagen and what happens is then, then they can actually take that, that that calcium and start to lay it down along this mesh to provide strength so if the bone doesn't have uh, collagen then what happens the bone loses strength there's a um, there's a condition that's called an osteogenesis imperfecta if you ever get a chance to look this up osteogenesis imperfecta it's a genetic type of a disorder and what they find out in osteogenesis imperfecta is that um, <clears throat> what we find is the uh, uh, they have abnormal collagen. The gene that makes the collagen that helps that's in bone is abnormal. And the collagen is abnormal. As a result, these people have very brittle bones and they break all the time. These kids usually have a shortened lifespan because they have multiple fractures throughout their life. They become significantly deformed. They, have, uh, they end up in a wheelchair after a period of time. And the thing that's interesting about these kids when you look at them, okay, besides having multiple fractures and multiple stages of healing, if you look at the whites of their eyes, which is called the sclera, the whites of the eyes are very pale blue. And the reason why they're pale blue is the white... Uh, the white is so thin because the white has a lot of collagen in it, okay? And it's so thin and so irregular, they actually see through that white of the eye. They actually start to see the darker pigmented areas in a deeper layer of that orbit or that of that eyeball. And that's what they're seeing through that looks like, like a blue a blue picture, okay? Last uh, vocabulary here I have on this page are cranial bones. Cranial bones are basically the bones that make up the skull. We have a number of bones that actually come together to form the skull, and they come together at small little joints called suture joints. If you ever get, if you ever go to like somewhere, everybody has their Halloween stuff out, and you see a skull on there, and you have all these little squiggly little lines, okay? These little squiggly little lines are called suture joints, and all the bones between the suture joints are called cranial bones. We have a number of them that come together to form a solid unit, okay? This is what we're talking about with the cranial bones. Let me get rid of my scratches here, okay? So if I'm looking at the skull here, you can see what happens is, you know, this, this bone right here is called the parietal bone. This bone right here is called the frontal bone. There's an occipital bone back here. Here's a temporal bone right here. This bone right here is part of the sphenoid. And these bones actually all come together to form a, a, to form a, a, a solid coconut shell, okay, basically to encase the brain. And these are all those little suture joints, like I mentioned, that come together. Uh, when babies are born, these suture joints aren't united very well. They're actually held together with connective tissue and it allows the baby's head to mold a little bit as it comes through the birth canal. If you see a baby who's a, a newborn, sometimes their heads are like, like they come into a point. And that's because these cranial bones, because there's, there's, it's not really, there's sort of gaps between a little bit of those. And there's also a large soft spot here, a large soft spot here. And those soft spots are called fontanelles, fontanelles. And they are not really, it's not like a brain right there. There's actually tissue that actually covers those, those areas. Those areas are closed. The one in the back closes usually about, about nine months. And the one in the front closes probably around 18 months. It's totally closed. They get smaller and smaller and smaller as time goes on. But the, but the skull, the cranium, which is this part that encloses the brain, this part that encloses the brain right here is a number of bones. And these are the cranial bones that actually enclose the brain. Okay, they're called cranial bones. More vocabulary uh, diaphysis okay the diaphysis is what we call if we look at a long bone okay this is this is a long bone we have here okay and what happens is is this area right here from here to about here okay is called the shaft or the diaphysis so the middle portion of the bone is called the diaphysis I'll have some more um, uh, images of this in another uh, video so this area right here is called the diaphysis okay the epiphysis, epi means what? Upon. So what happens to the epiphysis is the end of the bone here, the end of the bone here. It's on the upon the end of the bone, okay? And physis 
is another word that means growth. What happens is long bones, like this one here, this would be the femur, grows in length, not along the whole bone, but only at some plates down at the bottom and at the top, down in here and up in here. And there's one little right in here. And they're called growth plates. And these growth plates are where the bone will grow in length at these growth plates, okay? And this growth plate is called the physis because the physis means growth, okay? So basically, the area here that's upon the growth area is called the epiphysis because it's epi upon physis, upon the growth area, okay? And that's that. Now, the growth plate is also called the epiphyseal plate. And what this epiphyseal plate is, it's some specialized cartilage, and this specialized cartilage will actually go through multiple layers to transform itself from cartilage at one layer to bone at the opposite side, okay? So as a result, it will change. It will sort of modify itself going from one layer. There's actually five different layers. And it goes through a maturation process from being cartilage to becoming bone, okay? And that's at the epiphyseal plate. These epiphyseal plates at a certain age will stop, will, will actually fuse. The, they get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and narrower as a kid gets older. Eventually, they're, you have the, the epiphysis against the next portion of bone, and basically that, that area fuses and there's no more bone growth. So as long as that epiphyseal plate's uh, still open or still allow growth, the growth, the bone will grow in length, okay? A disc, okay? A disc, a disc is actually an area between the vertebrae. If I look at a vertebrae, another vertebrae, the disc sits between those two vertebrae, okay? So this is what we're talking here, okay? Now this is look at, this is sort of like an image of a disc, okay? And basically, uh, if we if we look at what we have here, here's a vertebrae, here's a vertebrae, here's a vertebrae, here's a vertebrae, and between the vertebrae are these little areas in here, and these are little fibrous areas that are between, and they're called discs, okay, or intervertebral discs. And what happens? They should be normal. This down here is what we see a herniated disc, and a herniated disc. What happens is that disc wears out, and what happens is now the, the vertebrae on the top, the vertebrae on the top pushes downward. Okay, and the one on the bottom pushes upwards. It squishes that disc, and part of that disc starts to bulge out. You'll see these holes right there? There's a hole there, there's a hole there, there's a hole. The nerve that comes off the spinal cord that goes through the rest of the body come through those holes. So what happens is that that disc bulges out, it presses against the nerve as it's coming out that hole, and that's why people with a herniated disc or a ruptured disc or a slipped disc, okay, actually will have pain that sometimes shoots down the leg. Why? Because the, the nerve that's coming out that hole is being pressed against by that disc that's bulging out, okay? And that's that's what happens with that. So that's called a, that's called a disc, okay? Facial bones, okay? Let me get rid of these. These are the facial bones. Okay, now we talked about the cranial bones being the bo bones that involve. We talked about the cranial bones being these puppies up in here. But the but the, the rest of the of the area here is made up of facial bones. And there's actually 14 facial bones. Here's that mandible, like we talked about, that lower jaw bone. Here's the maxilla, which is the upper jaw bone. Okay, this one's called the zygomatic bone right here. Zygomatic bone right here. We have uh, the vomer, which is this little blue thing in the middle. Okay, these are called the inferior nasal concave, which actually are little shelves on the inside of the nose. And then we have our nasal bones right there. So these actually provide some facial uh, features that we will actually have, okay? This would be the cheekbone, would be right in here, okay? It comes, this part of this, this, this zygomatic bone actually meets a little a branch or a little bar of bone that comes from that temporal bone that we talked about before that creates the, this, this cheek area right here, okay? And underneath that cheek area, the muscles that actually open and close, that actually close my jaw go underneath that little archway that is formed by there. But those are called facial bones. So the facial bones are the bones that make up the what? Make up the face, piece of cake, okay? Okay, a uh, couple words here. We're going to get to some of these a little bit later. Okay, and one's a fisher, a foramen, a fossa. Okay, a fisher, a foramen, and a fossa. Now, a fisher is basically something called a crack. Is a crack. So if I look at a fisher, if something is, is a fisher, it's basically a crack. Okay, not like a fracture crack, but a crack that's supposed to be there. If we look at the back, this is the orbit, this is a skull, and in the back of the orbit right here, there's a crack right there and a crack right there. One's called the superior orbital fissure, and one's called the inferior orbital fissure, and basically, a fissure is supposed to be there. 
because something has to go through that crack. And what goes through that crack in, this, in the eyeball or in the eye socket are the three nerves that go to the six muscles of the eye. Okay, So that crack is there. So a fissure is like a crack. It's like if you're watching the rock on the San Andreas and the earth opens up and stuff like that when the earthquake occurs. Basically, they call, oh, look at that fissure, and that fissure would be that crack. Okay, a foramen. A foramen's a hole. Okay. Now, if you look right here, this is the pelvis. This is that ilium that we talked about before. Here's the ischium, and this right here would be the pubis. Okay. There's a little hole right there. Okay. And that little hole is called the obturator foramen. Foramen, where the where a fissure is a crack. A foramen is a big hole. Okay. And that's a hole. If you look at the base of the skull, I don't have it here. At the base of the skull, right back. In the, in the back, there's a big hole, and that's where the spinal cord leaves the brain, leaves the cranium, and goes down through the vertebrae, okay? A fossa. A fossa is a little bit different, and I don't really see much. Here's, oh, here's a fossa right here. This is a fossa right here. A fossa would be this area right here. And what happens is a fossa is more like a, a depression in a bone, okay? It's not a hole, and it's not a crack, but the bone's solid, but there'll be a depression. And that depression is either allowing things to attach deeper in that depression, or in the case of here, because I look at the humerus, this is the backside of the humerus. Okay, now do this. If you if you build, bend your elbow like this, you feel that electron like we talked about before. It, it sort of like sticks out like a sore thumb, okay, or a sore, sore elbow. Now straighten your arm out, and almost like it's gone. Well, where did it go? What happens is when I straighten my arm out, that part of the electron actually fits in this depression that's in the back of the humerus. So it gets hidden in there. So that fossa is a is a is a shallow, uh, almost like a, a foxhole, you know, something like a shallow ditch, okay, that'd be sitting in there to allow something to sit in there. Now I mentioned the word fontanelle before, and the fontanelle is basically these things. Okay, let's look at this. This is a, like this would be a a diagram of an infant's head. Okay, or I even said, you know, sort of a neonate. And these are those soft spots, okay? So if I look right here, there's a fontanelle right here. There's a fontanelle right here. There's a couple of fontanelles on the side as well. But these fontanelles are, you know, those typical soft spots. They say, don't poke on the fontanelles. And basically, they're covered over by fibrous tissue. So it's not like the, you know, the brain is, is separated from the skin uh, and everything else by this fibrous tissue that sits right there. Now, these fontanelles are really sort of important at the time of delivery, okay? If you look at the fontanelles, they look different. This front right here, this is called, this. the nose would be up in here. So this is anterior, this is posterior here. So this is anterior, posterior back in here. The anterior fontanelle is really big and it's diamond shaped. The posterior fontanelle is smaller and it's triangular. So when the baby's coming down the birth canal, the obstetrician or whatever the case may be wants to know what position the baby's coming in. Nobody, the baby will come face down. Okay. If the mom's laying on her back, the baby will coming face down. And if it finally gets to the birth canal, it's going to do a little turn to the side. Okay. It's going to rotate about 90 degrees to be able to, 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 to deliver the shoulders. But before you see where that nose is, you want to know which position the baby's coming in. If the baby's coming nose up, sometimes it takes a little bit longer in the delivery. So the way to be able to find that is when they, the baby's coming down the birth canal, you might be able to see the top of the head because what happens is the area of the uterus is starting to stretch. That's that dilation that we'll talk about at the very end of the class. And what happens is they can actually feel the area of the baby's head and feel the fontanelles. The fontanelle, this fontanelle right here should be facing downwards, okay? And this fontanelle, which is easy to see because it's smaller and triangular, the anterior fontanelle is larger and diamond shaped, should be facing downwards, and this one should be facing upwards. And there they tell the baby's in the right position. If it's not in the right position, you're not, you're not much going to do with it, but you have at least a little idea which position the baby's coming down the birth canal. So these font, the fontanelle are these soft spots that we have there. Perversion canals, okay? Now, if I look at bone, if I look at dense bone, that, that compact, dense cortical bone, it looks like this, okay? And basically what we have is we have these cores of bone, okay? And these cores of bone are actually long cylinders, and they're called, that's called an osteon, osteon, E-O-N, okay? Osteon. And what happens is um, a cortical bone doesn't heal really well. Why? Because for things to heal, I need a good blood supply. There's not a really great blood supply to that cortical bone. But what happens is down the center of each of these cores of bone, there's a, a, a canal. And that canal is called a haversian canal. And inside that haversian canal is an artery, vein, lymphatics, as well as nerves. 
okay? And basically, that's how the bone gets its blood supply. These small canals, and there's millions of these in the bone. And here's another, here's another uh, osteon, here's another osteon, here's another osteon. And they're arranged, and then we have other uh, bone that fills in the gaps between those osteons. But this osteon, uh, everything right here, the, and the, all these little dark spots would be would be the osteocytes, or the or the actually the cells that are in the bone. But they get their, their nutrients and they get rid of their waste through this little canal in the center, which is basically called the Haversian Canal, with the blood vessels and 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 uh, nerve, you know, a vein that take blood away, uh, artery that brings blood too with nutrients, uh, uh, lymphatics which collect a, a lot of waste material as well and stuff like that, as well as nerve that will go in that in that in that canal. And it's called a Haversian Canal. Malleolus, like I mentioned before, the malleolus are those knobs on the inside, the outside, of the ankle. The lateral malleolus. Is basically the fibula. The medial malleolus comes like this, and this is the medial malleolus, and that's the tibia. So this would be the tibia right here. That's the fibula, okay? And there the malleolus, those ankle knobs. If we look here on these X-rays, okay, we can actually see it pretty well, okay? So if I look at this X-ray, okay, this is an X-ray of the ankle, okay? And looking at what we talked about, some of the words we talked about before. This is obviously the tibia. This is the fibula. This area right here is the fibular or lateral malleolus, because the lateral side, because the fibula is lateral. And this one over here is the tibial or medial malleolus. Medial malleolus, fibular malleolus. These bones right here would be the tarsal bones. And one thing I'd just show you just for, just because it's, it's, it's a good example of it, okay? Here's the fibula. And if you look really close, there's a fracture. See that line right there, that line right there, that line right there? That's a fracture of the fibula. And you can actually see it right here on this view right here, let me get rid of that so you can actually see where it is. See that little dark line, that little black line in it? That's the actually gap where the fracture occurs. So, but what we're really talking about is this line right here, or this bump right here, and this bump right here. Medial malleolus or the tibial malleolus, lateral malleolus or the fibular malleolus on the lateral side. Okay? That's what we see. You actually see a little bit of the fibular malleolus right there looking at it from the side. Some more vocabulary words, okay? Manubrium. Okay, now this is looking at the sternum like we talked about before. Okay, so let's look at the sternum, and and what happens is this area right here is the sternum. Okay, this top part right here is the manubrium. So that's the manubrium that we talked about before. And basically, this area is that little ditch up there, that little U-shaped U area you fill at the base of your neck, and that's called the jugular notch. And this area right here, where the manubrium meets the body, which is down in here, is called the sternal angle. And what's this right here? That's the second rib. It's a second rib. It's a, again a very important uh, uh, anatomical landmark. So that's called the manu that's called the manubrium body. And this little thing at the bottom, this little V-shaped area at the bottom, is called the xiphoid process. The xiphoid process. Okay, xiphoid. C i p h o i d. Okay, process. Okay, so that's the xiphoid process there. Okay, so that's what we have with that. Uh, now this is this area right here. Let me get rid of these scratches here. Okay. The mastoid process would be the next vocabulary term we have here. This little green area right here is the mastoid process. Now, if you take your finger and you feel behind your ear, you'll feel a little bump right back in here, and that's the mastoid process. Okay, that's part of this bone right here, which is called the temporal bone. It's part of the, one of the cranial bones. It's called the mastoid process. If you look at your neck, there's that big muscle that comes across your neck, and that muscle that comes across your neck is called the sternocleidomastoid muscle. And basically, because it attaches right here to go to the sternum. And clido also means collarbone. That's where that muscle attaches to in the area of the cranium. That's called the mastoid process. Okay. Uh, and people who have ear infections, let me get rid of that. You can actually see, okay, right here is a little hole. And that little hole would be the ear canal. And what happens when people have a middle ear infection, sometimes that pus starts to leak out. And it gets in this area of the, of the skull, in the area of the mastoid, and they get what's called a mastoid. Itis, which is basically an infection of the bone that's in this area, and that happens in some situations, not a whole lot, but it may happen. That's called mastoiditis. So that's the mastoid process. Okay. Now we talked about this before. Okay, the medullary canal. If I look at this bone that we have over here, again, here's my diaphysis. This area right here is the diaphysis or the shaft. If you look in the center. There's a canal, and that canal is actually filled with cancellous bone. That soft, or that, ooh, I said it bad, I should have said that spongy bone. So that's filled with the 
C-E-L-L-O-U-S. The cancellous bone fits inside there, that trabecular cancellous, or sometimes they call it medullary bone. And this area is called the medullary canal or medullary cavity. Again, if I go to that soup bone, you see the heart on the outside, and you see that softer area in the middle, and that part there would be a long bone that's cut across and across that medullary canal inside this area in here. Okay, So that's called the medullary canal or medullary cavity. Now, um, another word that I, that I should have... That I, that I didn't mention before because it came up a little bit later right now because of its um, alphabetical order, okay, is what's called the metaphysis, okay, the metaphysis. At the end of the bone, we talked about this, the epiphysis, because the growth plate sits right here. We know that this area right here is the diaphysis. The area that's between the metaphysis, it's between the epiphysis and the diaphysis is called the metaphysis. So at the end of a bone, okay, It's a bad bone, okay? The epiphysis would be out here. The metaphysis is right here. The diaphysis is right here. I have another metaphysis right here and an epiphysis sits right here. Now the metaphysis is really important because it's this area where we're changing from the from the from the the cancellous or from the from the dense shaft of the of the of the diaphysis it's starting to change. The bone is starting to flare out. So the bone is starting to change. Meta means change or after. Okay, so if it's after the area of the diaphysis, the bone is flaring out, so it's the area where the bone flares out, and what we're starting to lose some of that dense cortical bone and become thinner, because this area up here in the epiphysis is a very thin cortical bone around the outside and a lot more cancellous bone on the inside. So that's called the metaphysis. So a bone is epiphysis, metaphysis, diaphysis, metaphysis, epiphysis in that direction. And then what separates the epiphysis from the metaphysis right here would be the growth plate or the epiphyseal plate. Okay, so those are important factors to, to understand. Okay, next word we have here on our vocabulary list is periosteum. Now, what happens is the bone is covered by a membrane, and that membrane that covers the bone is called the periosteum. Peri means around, osteum means bone. It's a membrane that goes around the bone, and that membrane that goes around the bone actually has what's called osteoprogenitor capabilities. It's able to make new bone, okay? And that's called the periosteum. So it's a membrane, and we'll talk a little bit more about that before. I mentioned the olecranon before, and the olecranon is this area right here. So if we're looking you know, at the bone, here's the ulna, here's the radius right here. This area, that bump at the back of the elbow is called the olecranon, okay? Osseous tissue just means bony tissue. Nothing more than bony tissue, okay? Ossification. Ossification is the process of bone becoming bone. When bone actually starts out, it's mostly cartilage. And there might be a little bit of bone that's in one layer, a little area of it. As they get older and things, as time goes on, we get more and more bone, the bone comes to spread, and the cartilage now becomes transformed into bone, okay? Eventually the whole bone forms, and that's called ossification. So ossification is that process of a bone becoming from, from cartilage, a cartilage model. If I get a newborn uh, x-ray, it's mostly uh, a, a, a black. And it's mostly black in there because like there's no it's or actually not really can't say really black more of a, of a dark gray because it's cartilage it's the bone hasn't ossified yet but as the bone starts to ossify I still start to see more bones showing up the bone's always been there but it's just not uh, ossified yet okay the next two words down here are called osteoblast and osteoclast okay osteoblasts are bone building cells bone building cells. They make bone, okay? These bones actually spit collagen. They're like, uh, uh, in, in some other tissue, they, they have fibroblasts. I mentioned fibroblasts spit collagen. What happens in bone, the osteoblasts spit collagen, and they provide that matrix that we can start to get that calcium, calcium, that calcium or that, that calcium crystals to, to form on, on that matrix or that web that, that, that the collagen is made by the osteoblast. Osteoclasts are bone cells that will actually break bone down. Now, just, to, just a little bit of a hint to you, the bone you have now is not the bone you had six months ago. Your bone is constantly changing in little small little bundles throughout your entire body. And what happens is to put down new bone, I have to take away old bone. And these osteoclast cells go in there and they eat up or they dissolve bone. And what they dissolve, then they're followed by the osteoblasts. And the osteoblasts lay down the collagen matrix. Okay, and then following that, what happens, they sort of paint themselves into a corner where they can't do anything else because they start to lay down this matrix and they get in the center of these little gaps. They become, they become sort of like imprisoned inside the bone and they become what are called osteocytes. 
which are the normal everyday working cells of a bone. So osteoblasts are bone building cells, osteoclasts are bone breaking down or destroying cells, and osteocytes are the normal everyday working cells. Phosphorus. Phosphorus is basically uh, what's combined with a lot of the, uh, the calcium to provide that crystal nature inside the bone, and that's just phosphorus. Okay. So this is just the thing about osteoblasts, osteoclasts, and osteocytes. And basically, it says pretty much osteoblasts mature into new osteocytes because what they do is they lay down that, like I say, they lay down the collagen, and then they start to get sort of uh, imprisoned where the collagen is. They, they say, I can't do anything else. Say, so, okay, now guess what? You have now advanced. We're promoting you from an osteoblast to an osteocytes. So they become osteocytes. And the osteocytes are the no perm bone cells, and the osteoclasts resorb old bones so they can put down new bone. Okay. A few more here. Pubic symphysis. Where the where the pubis where the pelvis comes together in the front, this area right here is called the pubic symphysis. There's a little piece of cartilage that actually connects the pubis. This is the pubis right here. This is the pubis. This would be the ischium down here, ischium. And this area here is the ilium. Where the pubis comes together right here on, from one side to the other, it's held together by this little cartilage disc, and that's called the pubic symphysis, the pubic symphysis, okay? Red marrow, okay? Now, what happens is, again, like I mentioned before, okay, uh, if I look at an infant, in an infant, almost all the bone is able to make blood cells, okay? And that's what's called the red marrow. Eventually, as time goes on, again, here childhood, now I'm losing some of that, and part of this area in the middle gets replaced by what's called yellow marrow, which is basically more fatty marrow. It doesn't make blood cells anymore. Now we get to an adult, mature adult, or an adolescent, and it's basically only ends of some bones, a little bit down here, but some up in here, same thing, and we get older, and it goes down a little bit more. So red marrow is the part of the marrow that makes the blood cells or blood cells. And that's called the red marrow. Okay. Ribs. Do I really have to tell you what ribs are? Those are ribs, obviously. Okay. And the ribs are important. We'll talk a lot about the ribs when we talk about breathing. They're essential. Okay. And the ribs are basically flat bones that basically are, are interconnected between the two. If I look between, they're filled with muscle in here, muscle in here. And basically, in respiration, these muscles will contract, lifts the ribs up, and it changes the diameter from front to back and side to side of the chest, which then uh, decreases, so it causes like, like a vacuum or suction inside the chest, so air rushes into the trachea to fill the lungs. So that's called the ribs. Okay. We'll talk more about the ribs a lot more later on when we get to um, uh, talk about respiration. Now, this is a little area right here. This is called the cella tersica, the cella tersica. And cella tersica is a word that actually means Turkish saddle. And right here where the circle is, there's a little depression right here. Okay? And you can actually see this on an x-ray. And what sits inside there? The pituitary gland. So it's right inside there, right inside that cella tersica. And again, that looks like a Turkish saddle. It's high in the front, high in the back, and that's what we have right there. That's called the cella tersica. Sinus, okay? A sinus is basically an open area within the bone, okay? And we have a couple different sinuses, like here's a frontal sinus that we see right here. These are frontal sinus. These are called the maxillary sinuses right there. We have the sphenoid sinus and the ethmoid sinuses around the side of the nose. And, be, and they, these actually are, are um, openings within the skull, and they're lined with the same type of tissue that lines the inside of the nose. What does the tissue on the inside of the nose make? Hmm, begins with M, mucus. Okay, and what happens is they drain, and, and if we have, and they drain out through a canal into the nose. So the mucus is made, some of the mucus is made inside these, inside these sinuses, they drain into the nose. So when you have a cold, what will happen is those canals, because they're very small, they swell shut. You have swelling of those mucous membranes, they swell shut. You can't drain the fluid, and that's why the fluid starts to build up inside these sinuses, and that's what gives those sinus headaches, or that sinus pressure that you get with a cold or upper respiratory infection, okay? And that's called a sinus. If you actually, there's a, a cool uh, parlor trick. If you take a flashlight, go into a dark room, and you stick it just underneath your upper, you know, in, in, uh, just above your eye, right in this part right here, okay? the top of your forehead will glow. And you actually see the light that gets transilluminated through the skull into the area of the frontal sinus. And if you, with these right here, with the maxillary sinus, if I take a flashlight, a little pen light, and stick it right here in a dark room, open my mouth, the roof of your, of your, of your uh, mouth will actually glow because just above the roof of the mouth are these maxillary sinuses. So that's a sinus, okay? Uh, styloid process. If I look at a styloid process, that's 
this area right here. It's a little bump, a little nub at the end of the bone. This one's actually fractured. This one has a fracture. See that little gap right there? That's a fracture. But that's called the styloid process. So that little bump there. If you feel your, if you feel your, uh, that little bump right here, that's called the ulnar styloid right there. And there's one on the, on the medial side or on the lateral side, which is called the radial side, which is much smaller. Okay, and that's called the styloid process. Suture. Again, this is that suture joint that we talked about before, and that suture joint okay is where all the cranial bones come together so we're seeing all these little squiggly lines right there squiggly lines squiggly lines squiggly lines squiggly lines and those are all suture joints that's what they look like they're actually filled in with this fibrous material and as you get older that gets narrower and narrower and narrower and harder and harder and harder uh, they're they're apart a little bit to allow the brain and stuff like that the brain has a limited regenerative capacity so the brain is still going to grow for a little bit if you look at a baby their head's out of proportion to the rest of their body as you get older your body grows and your head doesn't grow nearly as fast because it doesn't have the same capacity. So what happens is these suture joints are a little bit of a buffer. They're like the gaps between you know, sidewalks to allow them. But eventually, as you get older, the brain matures, gets full size, these suture joints actually become solid, okay? And you can't really see very much. Temporal mandibular joint, okay? Here's the mandible, the lower, lower jawbone. This area right here is called the temporal mandibular joint. This would be the temporal bone right here. And this is where the mandible fits into a little socket right there. Now, if you take your hands and stick it right in front of your ears, okay, go ahead, put your hands on the side like here, right in front of your ears. Now open your jaw. And you actually feel the portion of the mandible right here pop forward. It actually comes forward. You'll actually feel it come forward. That joint's not really a, a, a round ball, but more like an oval. It allows the mandible to come forward. So when I open my jaw, you actually feel it come forward, and when you close your jaw, it moves backwards inside that little joint. And that's called the temporal mandibular joint. Some people have what's called TMJ syndrome, okay? They get hit on the jaw or something like that, or they're doing a lot of chewing material and stuff like that. It causes an irritation of the muscles that help to control that. That's called the TMJ syndrome, okay? Maybe you've had it, maybe you haven't. Trabeculi. Trabeculi are these little struts. Here's the temporal mandibular joint, okay? See it right there? Temporal mandibular joint right there. Uh, trabeculi. If I look at that cancellous bone, I'm looking at, let me get rid of these scratches here. Okay. And this is the end of a femur that we see right here. So here's the head of the femur. Uh, and this is the little bump you feel in your hip. We'll talk about that later on. But if you see all these little struts inside there, this is that spongy bone. That's that cancellous bone that fills that. There's, this is that cortical bone, the denser bone right here and right here. That's that cortical bone, the dense bone. But this, all the, and here's this, is this cancellous bone. Well, you say if it's softer, and that's a bad word, because that's why I don't like to use soft. If it's spongy, it should be compressible. Well, it's not, because what happens inside, there's little struts, like we see over here. If we look at this image over here, there's all these little struts. These little struts are lined up to provide like studs in a wall. So they provide significant strength to this part of the bone, even though it's lighter in weight, okay, than the denser cortical bone down here, where it has more, or bone down here, where it's more dense than cortical bone. But what happens is the way these struts are lined up provide significant strength, okay? And they're called trabeculi. They're called trabeculi, okay? Uh, we also have here what's a word in this, in this group called trochanter. Trochanter. This area right here is one on the other side. This one right here is called the greater trochanter. And the trochanter is a very large bump on a bone, okay, for attachment. This is where some of the muscles that rotate the hip will attach to. That's called a, tr a trochanter, okay? We also have what's called a tubercle. If I, look, if I look over here at this image right here, here's the trochanter right here. Here's a greater trochanter. This one's smaller, so they call that the lesser trochanter, okay? A little bit smaller than trochanter, which is a large bump, is a smaller bump, and a smaller bump is called a tubercle. There's a tubercle there. There's another tubercle that's right there. Smaller bump. So trochanter is a large bump. Tubercle is a smaller bump, a smaller bump. Couple more vocabulary terms. Tuberosity. Tuberosity. Okay. Tuberosity is basically, you can't see the, you can see it right there, but it's not, that's not really a good one. It's sort of a, a long uh, raised bump again for muscle attachment. If I looked at that ischium, on the bottom of the ischium, it's called the ischial tuberosity, and the hamstrings will attach to that. It's very rough and, and stuff like that. It's that, that U-shaped bottom. It's like the pelvis, or the ilium was up in there, and the ischium is the little 
of that little like horseshoe that's shaped at the bottom of the pubis was up on the top. Anyway, this right here on the bottom would be very rough, and that's called the ischial tuberosity. So the tuberosity is a is a sort of like an oblong raised bump. Again, it's for muscle attachment. Vertebrae. We talked about vertebrae. Here's the vertebrae we talked about. This is the cervical vertebrae. Here we have seven of those. These are thoracic vertebrae. I have 12, so I have seven cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic. These are the lumbar right here, so I have five lumbar vertebrae. I have one sacrum and one coccyx, one and one, okay? So basically, that's all the vertebrae we have. They're lined up on top of each other. We talked about those little areas in between called the intervertebral discs that we had before. So that's the vertebrae. We'll talk a little bit more about vertebrae later on, okay? But that's the vertebrae, okay? Uh, we talked about that, the rest of the sternum from before, okay? We talked about... Uh, this area up in here called the manubrium. Here's the body, and this area down here is that xiphoid. You can actually feel it. If you feel right here where your ribs come together on the bottom, you'll actually feel a little, uh, uh, a little um, spike of bone that comes out there, and that's the xiphoid. And actually, the mu there's a, there's a uh, where the muscles come together in the stomach and the abdomen. There is basically a, a band of tissue which is called the linea. Linea means line. Alba. Alba means white. Okay. Al, like albino. And what happens is, is, is that attaches right here in the muscles that in the abdomen will attach here and here. And that, you know, when you look at the washboard abdomens, I'd show you, but I can't, okay? What happens, because I don't have them, what happens if you look at that, you see that, that furrow right down the middle, and that starts where that linea alba is, which comes here, which is where the muscles all come together, okay? So that's so that's the xiphoid process, this little area down here. A yellow bone marrow, and again, when we looked at this image before, what we saw was the red bone marrow was the area where we're plate making making blood cells. The yellow bone marrow is basically areas which isn't making blood cells anymore. So we see a lot of, most of this is basically yellow marrow, and it's mostly fat. There's a lot of fat inside that marrow in most of the bones. Again, you only see a little bit here. Most of this is red marrow. This is red marrow here, red marrow here, red marrow here, a little bit of red marrow here, and, but most of the other areas what's called yellow marrow, okay? So that's what we see with it. A uh, couple of combining forms that we didn't talk about before. Uh, calco or calcio means calcium. Okay, obviously that sounds logical. Calco or calcio means calcium. Kypho, kypho means humpback or hunchback. If you look at sometimes you see these old folks and they have this big hump in the back, okay, in the thoracic region, the thoracic vertebrae, and that's called kyphosis. So kypho means hunchback or humpback. I'll show you this when we talk about the vertebrae later on. Lamino means lamina or arch. Uh, if I look at the vertebrae from the top down, the vertebrae has a large body right here, and that's where the bodies are stacked one on top of the other, where the discs are. And then there's a, an archway that comes from that and there's a spine that sticks out the back like here, a spine that sticks this way, a spine that sticks this way. This one right here, you actually feel, you feel those little bumps right down the middle of the back. That's called the spinous process, okay? And then this area right here are called transverse process because they're going sideways. And these are all for muscle attachment and stuff like that. But there's the archway right here. And in the middle of the archway right here would be the spinal cord. The spinal cord sits right inside that archway, okay? Well, this area right here and this area right here is called the lamina lamina okay and basically this area right here is called the pedicle and this area right here this part of the archway is called the lamina so it's a little part a little archway part of that of that vertebral uh, or spinal canal that sits right in there and that's what that is lordo lordo means sway back so when we looked at the back so this would be anterior and this would be posterior in that, in that area of the kypho okay what happens if i look at the back and someone who has lordosis what happens it's like this. So this would be the lumbar region, so this is still posterior, and this would be anterior here. That's that sway back appearance. You ever look at these old gymnasts, you know, they come off a dismount and their back looks like this, you know, so their arms are coming this way, their legs are here, and they get, and their belly is like this, but they have their back is really curved like that. That's called a lordosis. So the lordo means that. Lumbo means the lumbar region, the lower back region. Again, I had seven cervical, 12 thoracic, I have five lumbar vertebrae, okay? And basically that would be the lower back region. Myelo, myelo means bone marrow. It also means spinal cord, but that's not what we're gonna talk about right now, but it means the bone marrow, okay? So people who have an osteomyelitis, what they do is they have an infection of the bone that involves the bone marrow, okay? So myelo means bone marrow. Ortho, like we told about, mentioned before, means straight, means straight, okay? Uh, not, doesn't mean bone, but means straight. 
Osteo means bone. So if you see osteo, that means bone. That's obvious bone. Scolio means crooked or bent. Now, this is something most girls know, guys don't know a whole lot. But if we look at these two images here, both with the with the, uh, with the uh, 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 kyphosis and the lordosis, are looking for the side, looking on this, you know, looking at sort of like a, uh, a, a sagittal or mid-sagittal plane view. If I look from the back, if I'm looking at someone from the back, what we see in scoliosis is we see a side-to-side -side curve. So the, the shoulder here, arm come down here, and the back would be curved like this. Now, uh, this happens a lot more in females. They have this scoliosis. Now, there's a bunch of different reasons. I could probably spend another hour just talking about scoliosis. But this is a side-to-side -side curve that we get in the back. Okay, And basically, that's called a scoliosis. And usually what happens is not just even a side-to-side -side curve, but the vertebrae get actually rotated around. So if you actually look at them, they're asymmetric. They like, look like the vertebrae is not just side-to-side -side bent, but also twisted around in a little bit. And that's called, that's called scolio. Okay, So scolio. Spondylo. Spondylo is a word root that means vertebrae. So people who have a spondylitis, basically they have an inflammation of the vertebrae. There's a thing that happens now, the scoliosis is occurring mostly in females. In males, we have something called an ankylosing spondylitis, where actually the, the discs, if I have a, 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 a vert, vert, vertebral body, the discs between, the discs actually start to harden over. And actually it's called a bamboo spine because it looks like bamboo. If you look at bamboo, there's a piece right there, there's a joint. And, Bamboo and another joint like that. If you look at bamboo, the same thing happens with these people and they can't bend. Their back becomes very stiff. But spondylo is a word root because all these are word, word roots, okay? And basically it means vertebrae. And vertebro also means vertebrae. Okay, that should be an easy one. Don't spend too much time studying vertebro because if you don't know that, you're, you're going to be way behind the learning curve. I mean, it's pretty obvious. Uh, and then these words right here are basically taking the vocabulary words that we had before and making them into combining forms. Obviously, acetabulo means acetabulum. Calcaneo means calcaneus or heel bone. Carpo means carpal. Clavicular means clavicle. Costa we didn't have. Costa was one that I put it here in red with different different stars, and that means ribs. Ribs. Okay, we had this when we talked in, in the first section in module one. We mentioned about costal, in, intercostal, and stuff like that. So, costo means ribs. Uh, cranio means, you know, uh, cranium. Uh, femoral means femur. Fibula means fibula. Humeral means humerus. Ilium means ilium. Ischio means ischium. I've just taken the same words and put them in there. And then we have me uh, malleola means malleolus. Mandibulo means mandible. Maxilla means maxilla. Metacarpal means metacarpal. Metatarsal means metatarsal. Olecrano means olecranon. Patello means patella. Pelvi, epi pelvi means what? Pelvis. That should be simple. You know, it should be a big perineal. That's one that you don't have any clue on. What happens on the outside of the leg? That's called the perineal region. There's some muscles that are attached to the fibula laterally, and they're called the perineal muscles. One's called the peroneus longus, and one's called the peroneus brevis. Guess why they call the longest the longest? Because it's the longer of the two. Guess what they call the brevis the brevis? Because it's briefer, the shorter of the two. So the lateral aspect of the leg down here is called the perineal region. Okay, Phalangeal, phalanges, or you know, fingers and toes, pubo, radio, scapulo, sterno, tarso, tibio, ulno. All these are words, word roots that are made from the vocabulary words we talked at the beginning. I thought it was easier to do show the vocabulary words first and then go to the word roots. So if you take those vocabulary words that we at the very beginning and you take it, slash O, basically you make a word root out of it. So it's pretty simple to figure that one out. Okay, a couple of important skeletal suffixes that we're almost getting to the end of this uh, this puppy. Blast, okay. Blast is a, a word that means an immature cell, okay. That's where we got my uh, osteoblast. It's an immature cell. Um, it comes from embryonic origins or what's called mesenchyme. You know if you remember that word. But basically it's it's a cell that's want, it, 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 it has to grow up yet. Okay, uh, blood cells. When blood cells go from a, a, a stem cell to a, what's called an erythrocyte, a red blood cell, they, they at, at some point they're called an erythroblast, which is an immature red blood cell. So if you see the word blast after something, it means it's an immature cell. Class. Class means to break something up. We talked about the osteoclast. What does the osteoclast do? It breaks down bones. It breaks down bones. Listhesis. Listhesis means slipping, okay, or to slip. Sometimes what happens is if I have the vertebrae, they're lined up one on top of the other. What happens is there's little joints in these little archways that we talked about a little bit before. There are little joints that connect these archways here and the discs connect here. Sometimes if these archways don't connect very well, one vertebrae may actually slip and actually will move forward. So maybe the next one down here has moved forward. This would be called 
uh, spondylo, because spondylo means spine, spondylolisthesis, because now that vertebrae has slipped forward. So listhesis means to slip or slippage. Malacia means softening. We see when people, when they have certain bone diseases, they what's called osteomalacia or softening of a bone, okay? People, when they have osteoporosis, is frequently associated with osteomalacia. Physis, this is a word we talked about as the growth. That's where they get the word epiphysis, growth plate, of physis. Physis means growth, okay? Porosis means porous. That's where we get the word osteoporosis. When we look at osteoporosis, I'll show you some pictures of osteoporosis in another video. What happens is, is when we start to lose the, 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 the structure, all those struts, on the inside, those tra I mean, here's a better word, all those trabeculi, which is a vocabulary word, we start to lose that in osteoporosis. And as a result, now there's larger open air spaces. It's like bread that has a lot of air spaces in it, becomes more porous, and that's what we see. So porosis means porous. Tome, tome means to cut. And the only reason why I push this in here is there's an instrument that we used to use to cut some bone. And if, if there's a little bump off a bone, it was like a chisel. But a chisel looks like this. If I look at the end of a chisel, if you haven't done any word work, chisel comes like this, has two parallel plates. It comes down to a point like that. And this is what you cut something with. An osteotome is not like that. It's like this. It's like a knife at the end. It looks like a chisel, but it doesn't have this little wedged area right here. It comes like to a direct point. And you just take that with a little hammer, a little mallet, and you chip off bone. Okay? So tome means to cut. Means to cut. So what have we talked about here? A lot of stuff. Okay? Um, at, at, by the by, look going over this video, you should be able to name all the bones that we talked about here, uh, and a, a lot of those can be made into uh, word roots, like we talked about. Okay, we defined a lot of those words and stuff like this. So the vocabulary list here is pretty extensive. It's going to take a couple times through to probably figure it out. Again, go back to the PowerPoints and list all those things out, and it's going to help you a lot. Uh, but that's the first portion. I think what happens is the blessed list to start to talk about bone because we're going to be talking about some lumps and bumps on bones in another video. Okay, and uh, uh, spinal segments and stuff like that. We'll be talking about that. And then we'll also have a little fun one talking about some conditions, which isn't quite as critical to know, but I think it's sort of a fun area to look at. So what we talked about now is laying a good basis, a good groundwork for uh, uh, how, how, you know, about the parts of a bone, uh, the different bones that we have in the body, uh, and very related words to that. So hopefully it may sound a little bit daunting right now with the volume that we have. We actually went a much longer uh, video time than we usually have, usually a regular class period. And actually sometimes in a class, this actually takes me more than one class period to get through this particular portion of the PowerPoint. But uh, I think it's, it's, the, it's, it's the best place to start because once you know this and you feel comfortable with this, uh, things that come after it are going to be a little bit easier. Okay. So in the meantime, uh, enjoy. Uh, watch it a couple times if you really want or if you really want to torture yourself, that's fine. You can do that. i uh, watch it uh, four or five times, but uh, it's, it's good stuff and uh, it's stuff that you probably should know. Okay, we'll talk to you later with the next video. Where we'll talk about some lumps and bumps and bones.